There is a fairy that flies so far under the radar, it is rarely spoken of. Many have never even heard of him. He dwells in the borderlands between Scotland and northern England and acts as a guardian of wild animals. And any hunter with a mind to kill will find themselves in his sights. G'day, I'm Kitty. Welcome to Fairy Encounters. This fairy may look comely, but he will tear you to pieces if you cross him. He's easy to avoid and so not as dangerous as other less predictable members of the fairy folk. And his motivation when harming humans is clear. Some people might even consider his actions justified. I wonder what you'll think. Now, let's settle in and relax as we get to know the brown men of the Muirs. The brown men of the Muirs dwell in the northern borders of England, the counties of Cumberland and Northumberland, and over the border into Scotland. Though sightings of them were once common, they are rarely seen these days, instead keeping to themselves within the rocky crags and the caves and the masses of bracken. They are said to act as guardian to the moors of the north and actively and aggressively protect wild animals who dwell in the region. Now these include deer, wildfowl, foxes, rabbits and sheep. In fact, so passionate are the brown men in protecting local wildlife in their region that they are known to actively seek out and punish those who might cause them harm. It is long believed that any person in mind to go hunting in around the England-Scotland borderlands is in real danger of being hunted themselves. The brown men dish out their own justice to those who hunt wildlife for sport or for their own entertainment. If we read in between the lines of accounts of the brown men of the mules, we might suppose they are more tolerant of those who hunt animals for the table, that is, for to feed their family, as opposed to those who hunt for a jolly good sport. There are accounts of the brown men following hunters and not only sabotaging their efforts, but attempting to lure hunters away with them, and, yes, sometimes, even killing hunters. In his book, William Henderson tells us of a letter sent to Sir Walter Scott, which described a close call with a brown man in around the town of Elsdon in Northumberland, This is how that letter ran. In the year before the Great Rebellion, two young men from Newcastle were sporting on the high moors above Elsdon, and, after pursuing their game several hours, sat down to dine in a green glen near one of the mountain streams. After their rest, The younger lad ran to the brook for water and, after stooping to drink, was surprised on lifting his head again by the appearance of a brown dwarf who stood on a crag covered with brackens across the burn. This extraordinary personage did not appear to be above half the stature of a common man but was uncommonly stout and broad-built, having the appearance of vast strength. His dress was entirely brown, the colour of the brackens, 
and his head covered with frizzled red hair. His countenance was expressive of the most savage ferocity, and his eyes glared like a bull. It seems he addressed the young man, first threatening him with his vengeance for having trespassed on his lands, and asking him if he knew in whose presence he stood. The youth replied that he supposed him to be the lord of the moors, that he had offended through ignorance and offered to bring him the game he had killed. The dwarf was a little mollified by this submission, but remarked that nothing could be more offensive to him than such an offer, as he considered the wild animals as his subjects and never failed to avenge their destruction. He condescended further to inform him that he was, like himself, mortal, though of years far exceeding the lot of common humanity. He never, he added, fed on anything that had life, but lived in the summer on whortleberries and in winter on nuts and apples, of which he had great store in the woods. Finally, he invited his new acquaintance to accompany him home and partake of his hospitality, an offer which the young man was on the point of accepting and was just going to spring across the brook, which, if he had done, the dwarf would certainly have torn him to pieces when his foot was arrested by the voice of his companion, who thought he had tarried too long, and on looking around again, the wee brown man was fled, he said. The story adds that he was imprudent enough to slight the encounter and to sport over the moors on his way homewards. But soon after his return, he fell into a lingering disorder and died within the year. We might suppose historical novelist, poet, historian and Scotsman Sir Walter Scott had more than a passing interest in the brown men of the Muirs. Cult of Kildar is an old ballad included within a collection published by Sir Walter Scott in 1802 and was, by all accounts, a bestseller. It's a lengthy poem of a grand adventure, but I'd like to share with you just a part of the ballad where the hunter, Kildar, stumbles across a grumpy brown man of the moor who has been wakened in the early morning by Kildar's hunting bugle. The poem finds us with Kildar having just blown his bugle for the third time. The third blast that young Kildar blew Still stood the limber fern, and a wee man of swarthy hue, up started by a can. His russet weeds were brown as heath that clothes the upland fell, and the hair of his head was frizzly red as the purple heather bell. An urchin clad in prickles red clung cowering to his arm. The hounds, they howled and backward fled as though struck by fairy charm. Why rises high the staghound's cry where staghound ne'er should be? Why wakes that horn the silent morn without the leave of me? Brown dwarf that over the moorland strays, thy name to Kildar tell. 
the brown man of the moors who stays beneath the heather bell. Tis sweet beneath the heather bell to live in autumn brown, and sweet to hear the lay rocks swell far, far from tower and town. But woe betide the shrilling horn, the chaser's surly cheer, and ever that hunter is forlorn, whom first at morn I hear. Weal nor woe, nor friend nor foe, in thee we hope nor dread. But afore the bugle's green could blow, the wee brown man had fled. We might suppose that this sort of chance encounter was not uncommon back in the day when this type of sport was more prevalent, so I tend to think that Kildar was lucky to have escaped that encounter unharmed. I really wanted to share that excerpt from that poem with you as it gives us a terrific physical description of the brown men, small in stature and swarthy, meaning dark-skinned, with frizzy red hair to the head. He's easy to imagine, as Kildar describes him, as a brown dwarf. He certainly has a very distinctive physical appearance and isn't likely to be mistaken for another. This ballad describes an urchin clinging to the brown man's arm, which for the age probably meant some sort of goblin creature who perhaps the brown man was protecting. And what really interests me as a dog person is though he was small in stature, the hunting dogs were said to cower at the sight of the brown man, to howl and back away, and this is actually common in many accounts of the brown men of the mules. The dogs knew exactly what they were dealing with, and the brown man makes it clear that he is not well pleased to see this hunting party. Then he disappears and the ballad moves on. We can only imagine what came next. From other reports of the brown men of the mules, this brown man likely shifted to stealth mode in an attempt to thwart the efforts of the hunters. And who knows, perhaps some of those huntsmen became the hunted and did not return home that day. So it seems it's easy enough to avoid becoming the victim of a furious brown man. You just don't go hunting wildlife, or perhaps any kind of life, in the borderlands between northern England and Scotland. But if you are in mind to go hunting for sport, and do find yourself caught by a brown man, what can you do? Well, regardless of their height, they are known to be very strong, but they are also intelligent, determined, and, some say, they can be truly charming too. An altogether formidable threat In the case of the brown men, I think avoidance is your best bet. But if you take your chances and went hunting and were caught, how could you save your own skin? Well, this is a question which has plagued hunters for hundreds of years. In his 1869 book, Author Scamble suggests that an angered brown man can be appeased or calmed by chanting a very peculiar phrase in his ear. He claims that after hearing these words, 
the red-eyed man will not only be courteous, but helpful too. Take a look at his tail. One day, when I was in Cumberland, I set off late in the evening, and after a time I lost myself among the mountains. At last, as it grew dark, I found myself in a gloomy ravine between very high rocks, which round and round about as though there was no end to it. I heard nothing but the ravens croaking among the crags above me. They did not know that I understood them, so they talked about me freely, and what they all said was, Look at that foolish fellow. He little knows where he's going. Tomorrow we'll eat his eyes, and then we'll pick his bones. And then they set up a kind of hoarse, horrid, grating laugh among themselves. However, I was determined to go on, hoping to meet with some strange adventure. Indeed, it would have been no use turning back, for I had quite lost my way, and it was getting pitch dark. So on I walked, and kept stumbling over large stones that lay in my way. After a time, I fancied I heard in front of me the sound of someone whistling, and sometimes singing at the pitch of his voice in harsh, shrill tones. But it was too dark for me to see anyone. The sound seemed to go on as I went on. Indeed, the person who uttered them seemed to be travelling very fast, for I had much difficulty in keeping within hearing of his voice. At last the moon appeared, and I perceived, about one hundred yards in front of me, a most extraordinary figure. It was that of a man, about four feet high, dressed in brown, who went springing from rock to rock with wonderful activity, singing or whistling all the time. I shouted after him, but he paid no attention to me. Determined to get to him, I ran forward as fast as I could, and when I got near enough, threw a large stone at him and hit him on the head. He uttered a tremendous yell and turned around, roaring at me, full of fury. His face was as brown as earth and looked one hundred years old, but he must have been wonderfully strong, for he heaved from the ground a huge stone, far bigger than I could have lifted, raising it above his head in his long arms, as if he meant to throw it at me. And then, so he did, but I slipped out of the way. He then rushed at me with a loud roar, seized me in his long arms, and would have dashed me against the rocks in a moment. But I had long heard of the brown men of the moors and mountains. Though I had never met with one before, and a very wise old woman had once told me of a charm by means of which they might be appeased when angry. The charm was this, to put one's mouth near the brown man's ear and say, Mungo tickle snow out to Dixie This I did, and all at once he put me down and looked at me with wandering eyes. Well, I'm not sure I'd put my trust in muttering those words to 
save myself from a furious brown man, I suspect whispering, might be just as effective. Perhaps the words are simply meant to stop the brown man in his tracks and bewilder him for a moment. Maybe that was Scamble's point after all. If you get caught hunting by a brown man, you might as well pull a chant or a prayer or a song out of thin air. All would work as well as the other to save you from being skinned and hooked by the brown man. If a fairy dwelt in the one region over many, many ages, in harmony with the environment and its creatures, it's not surprising that they would have affection for the creatures that they live beside and take offence at those who would seek to harm them, to kill them for pleasure or sport. It seems the topic of the brown men of the Muirs was at one time one which was discussed regularly, but it's not any more, is it? So where have all the brown men of the Muirs gone? Perhaps they've not gone anywhere. Perhaps they still dwell in the rocky crags and caves and masses of bracken in the northern borderlands, but are simply rarely seen. In days gone by, only what we might call the privileged within society would have had the weapons, the horses and all the other resources to hunt for sport. But that is not necessarily so now. And given how human weaponry has changed over the years, grown more sophisticated if you like, Hunters may not need to get so up close and personal with their prey as in times gone by, and the sport of hunting is accessible to more people and can be done from a distance, and the brown men of the Muirs may have no answer for these modern weapons. One thing is certain. If they are still there, and I sure hope they are, the brown men would be doing all within their power to continue protecting wildlife in their region. Perhaps they rely more on other methods, such as stealth and sabotage, to thwart the efforts of hunters these days. Well, they're just a few ideas, but what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. If you've made it this far and enjoyed my video, please consider becoming a patron of the channel. You can see the names of my gorgeous patrons on the screen right now. YouTube doesn't do a lot to help small channels like mine, it really does my head in sometimes, to be fair. So the support of patrons makes a real difference to me. So if this is something that you could consider, please check in the links below to find out more. Now I'll let you go, but until next time, stay curious and be kind. Cheerio! Cheerio!